are you? So I'm Ian, I'm the art director on Star Citizen. I'm Michel, hello again, uh, lead on the organics <laughs> team. Hi, I'm Nick, I'm the uh, lead environment artist on the uh, landing zone team. And I'm Eddie, I'm the lead environment artist on the modular team. Okay, so let's go through a quick overview of some topics we're gonna cover. First, we wanna talk a little bit about the team formation. Um, and why we're kind of set up in this way. Next, we'll talk a little bit about the visual development of the space stations, uh, both the exterior and the interior, and some of the uh, notes on the direction we're taking. Then we'll take a deep dive into the visual design of the new landing zone, New Babbage, and then right at the end, we'll explore some of the biomes uh, that we're gonna see on Microtech. Okay, let's start with the environment team art formation. So, um, as you know, like the locations in Star Citizen uh, are quite diverse. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to format um, our team in a way in which we can work on multiple things in parallel, but not necessarily overstretch the team, um, which would ultimately reduce the quality. Okay, so first thing I want to talk about uh, is the landing zone team. So obviously the focus of this team is focusing on, you know, cityscapes, spaceports, hub areas of the landing zone, common elements, things like that. Um, and that team is largely focused on kind of like maintaining or implementing the complexity of what these landing zones are. Next, we've got the modular team. So the focus of this team is kind of making sure that in between landing zones, there's locations to go to. So that things like space stations, ground locations, space locations, things like that. So the, the kind of like the core resource of this team is to try and um, utilize our build insects in a bit more of a creative way. So it's, it's more about um, ensuring we get the quantity of locations in our game uh, to support gameplay. And then the third team is the organics team. So uh, fairly self-explanatory, but the focus is on planets, moons, caves you've seen a little bit of already, but also supporting other production teams with things like organic asset packs and things like that. So the focus of this team, beautiful landscapes, and working closely with other teams. Uh, obviously, it's not, we're not just environment artists, so you know, we get warm hugs from quite a few other disciplines. Um, but as you can see here, hopefully that gives you like a little internal, uh, a little look at our, our internal formation um, and hopefully give you a little bit of confidence in how we can kind of move forward and work on a few different things in parallel. Okay. So let's start real quick with the modular team. Um, okay. So we had rest ups in our game uh, for some time. Um, we were happy, but they had a fundamental problem. Um, essentially, we needed to um, diversify the visual design of them. I don't know if you remember these guys, this is a clay render of one of the originals. And it didn't really matter how we kind of changed it, it still kind of looked the same. Um, so Chris was very passionate with me, he said, hey, you know, I want space stations in Star Citizen to be diverse, beautiful, vast. So what we did was we sat down with the concept team and we had a very intense period of visual development. Um, to try and generate ideas of what the next steps of space stations could feel like. So here you can see an example sheet of that result. So after a couple of weeks of um, you know, fairly intensive work, this is like an idea board uh, that we put in front of Chris. Um, so even from quite small thumbnail images, um, you can kind of see how diverse some of the ideas could feel. And we wanted uh, designs to feel iconic and, and fairly recognizable. Uh, and then for those of you with really good eyesight, maybe you can recognize some of the categories we're putting them in. And the idea is we want the core space station to design um, to be primary, and then what we do is we use additional elements to help define the theme of that space station. Okay, let's take a little sne sneak, speak, sneak peek at some of the um, archetypes which we uh, want to explore. So this is an ex early example of, um, of a cargo. So from Chris, right from the beginning, he wanted a very busy kind of shipping port vibe. 
And one thing I'll note is a lot of these renders, we deliberately didn't surface anything. Um, we wanted to almost give that um, aesthetic of a, an old scratch-built model from like ILM or something, just to validate the shape and form without getting into the details. So this is like a slightly larger, more developed infrastructure. And you can see like the cargo containers are now kind of formatted into larger units. And that tiny little hub area is in the middle, whereas the uh, outer connections for cargo will be on the outside of the infrastructure. And then we also tried a vertical design. Uh, ultimately, this had too many problems. Like, Todd was like, hey, man, what, what happens if, if I fly right through there? You know, cargo's just going to go, right? <laughs> um, but there's elements of this that we kind of liked, and you can actually see in game right now. OK, so we expanded the cargo unit rack design. And ultimately, we're looking for an idea uh, where the hub was quite small and insignificant compared to the cargo. Um, but as you can see, like the first read of this, we went, oh, that, that, that's a cargo station, you know. Continued design exploration. This time, we're kind of taking cues from Port Olisar because Port Olisar should be a, a port station, right? So this was us just validating what with this design language, what something like Port Olisar could feel like. OK, let's move on to some refineries. So we like the idea of something exposed. So it shares some common elements from the other stations. But we like the idea that the protective layers of other stations have been exposed. So you just seen that the inner workings. And we also like the idea of something skeletal, lots of negative shapes. And also, you can see like a range of comp arrays of components. And this can also be used to kind of describe, you know, um, expanding out the scale of operations. So if you see something with like large quantities of the rays, it kind of implies like it's a bit more of an established operation. And we also wanted something that had like struts leading off from the main hub and kind of having a little bit of fun at what these stations could feel like because the design for zero gravity. Okay, let's move back on to rest stops. Fundamentally, you know, we wanted designs that could work vertically as well as horizontally. And we also wanted the idea of, like Chris described it as, you know, you come across like a backwater space station, but then that's fundamentally different to a space station that you'd see on a major kind of trade hub. So it was having a look at what like expanded modules building out from the core could feel like. And also we're exploring various shapes, which, which we did with these rings here. So this was a core shape that internally we really latched onto. And then like it enabled us to do new things like, like array and hangers around that core. So because it's in space where you need to validate composition from all different angles. And even from this clay render, we felt you know, quite confident about the compositions that we'd expect to have. Um, and then I just loved that, that strut leading out, really leading out from the main core and was really thinking about what that experience would be if we landed on there, you know, what that would feel like. And then eventually we want physical transit elevators bringing us into the core. So just to repeat this slide again, hopefully you can kind of see what we're doing. We're not necessarily, you know, building unique space stations for each one, but we're trying to invest into what our core space station uh, visual style is. And then when we come to do like uh, refineries or cargo depots, it's a bit more of an additional approach. And then this is just a slide. You know, you just saw this guy um, in the demo. We just saw it's in game right now. But you know, it kind of maybe gives you a little bit of a backstory as to how we got to this point, and then maybe gives you a little sneak peek as to you know what some of the next steps could feel like. Okay, so let's move on from the X series, and then let's move on to the interiors. I'll pass you on to Eddie. Pass me the clicker. <clears throat> So I guess the problem with the interiors is really the same as with the exteriors. They weren't really big enough, and they weren't really varied enough. So um, especially now the larger exteriors have come into the game, the current interiors feel both kind of very small and just not much variety between them, between the rest stops. And we also wanted, we set out with an idea that we wanted to make the stations flow and the layout feel generally more open rather than separate areas into distinct segments with smaller doorways and doors. Um, so I'm going to be talking through just some of the various components we improved and added to to achieve the new interiors. And then I'm also just going to give a brief breakdown of some of the modular workflows and tools. 
So uh, let's start with hubs. The hubs are kind of the nexus of the stations. We made them bigger. We gave them a more spacious and kind of a grander atmosphere to a scale intended to kind of match or mirror the increase in size of the exteriors. Um, we've also added some more variety of hub spaces, along with more variation in lighting and dressing. Um, and then in addition to that, we just take a look at the quick look at what we've done to the shops. Um, the shops were kind of an important change. Previously, all our shops were kind of gated behind doors. So we changed them to all be open fronted. Um, kind of enhances the more open feel of the station as a whole. Um, it also provides what we call curb appeal a lot more. Um, opening up the fronts entices people in, and it's something you see a lot in uh, real life stores as well if you go to a shopping center or a mall. Um, it kind of softens the transition between the inside and the outside. Um, next, we're going to have a look at the mom and pop shops. Now, the mom and pop shops are kind of a new type of station we haven't seen, a uh, type of shop that we haven't seen in stations before. We've kind of made these independently owned rather than tied to a specific brand or a specific corporation, hence the mom and pop. Um, and as they are brandless, we've kind of established a new set of advertising and iconography with the UI guys that we can use universally across any kind of utilitarian shops we want to create in the future as well. Um, the bars, the bars are another new addition to rest stops. Um, the bars are traditionally kind of a big part of landing zones as they provide spaces for mission givers to hang out in. So we've added bars to the rest stops to provide a similar sort of gameplay um, function. Um, food court shops, right. So the food court is a new addition um, to the rest stops as well. Um, starting with the shops, we've kind of created a new set of shops specifically for the food courts. Um, they're all open-fronted in the same way all the shops now are. Um, and also, they are also independent and kind of non-corporate for kind of a friendlier, more sort of low-budget feel. And you'll see they're all made independently of the food court itself, so that when the layout tool does its thing, uh, positions within layouts will vary between generations. Um, oh, I've skipped a slide there, but that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> the food court itself. So the food court itself is another new space. We knew we wanted a, a larger secondary space other than the hubs that's kind of specific to rest stops. So we, we developed the food court, and food is going to be a gameplay mechanic in the future. So we've kind of pre-established the food court as a space in our new rest stops going forwards. Um, another thing we've kind of developed as well is the idea of layouts. Um, I'm sorry, I mean overlays. Um, overlays, what overlays do is essentially they provide the same base architecture with a simple swap of an overlay. We can kind of completely change the atmosphere of a space with a simple overlay swap. And here's another shot of sort of the upper deck of the food court with the small eating area inside it. Um, okay, so Habitation, you'll probably all recognize this brand. Um, I'm sure most people have woken up in an easy hub here. Um, rest stops are now going to accommodate habs, and they're going to accommodate player spawn points. So we took our existing easy hub set, and we've basically expanded on it slightly to produce a slightly bigger version of easy hub for use with the new rest stops. Um, View rooms. So view rooms are kind of another really important addition that we wanted to get right for the new rest stops. Um, they've dramatically increased in scale. It's more of a view deck now than a room. Um, the issue with the old view rooms really was that they were very small, and the player never really had any reason to actually go to them, because in the layouts, they were always at a dead end, essentially. So there was never any reason to go and look out the window. With the new view rooms, um, we kind of, and especially with the new layouts of the stations, we kind of direct the player through this space on their way to other locations within the rest stop. So the player has much more chance to actually get a good view out of the window. And again, it's really important. They've become a much more important space to remind the player of their connection to the outside world. And as you saw in the demo, um, we're now going to be putting stations in low orbit around our major planets. So it's something we've wanted to do for a while. And it's going to give you some really, really nice vistas, hopefully. Um, so yeah, we're quite excited about that. Um, 
So just to um, give you a brief breakdown of how the modular team works, because it works in a much different way than maybe a traditional level is made. Instead of building a layout by hand, we kind of build all the components and use the procedural tools to generate many different layouts rather than hand building individual ones. So here's a library of rooms that are kind of unique for the rest stops themselves. Um, and this is a library of more universal rooms that we can use going forwards in different space stations uh, in the future. Um, on top of that, then, we have libraries of props, which are small collections of items, all filtered by category and type. Um, and then the same deal with advertising, um, filtered by color. Lighting, use a lot of these to light the station, so they need to be able to decide, oh, I want a warm color here, I want a cool color there. Um, what all these libraries and all these categories and all these filters allow an artist or a designer to do is, is kind of direct the general flow of a station um, interior, but the actual content and how it all fits together is randomized every time. Um, it's all driven by a layout graph, which is the prettiest slide in this presentation, this art presentation. <laughs> um, but it's kind of a node-based thing that we use. A designer or an artist can snap these nodes together and say, I want this general flow for a station. And then we've got a video of basically that graph. This is the tool doing its thing with that graph. And you can see it's testing connection points. It's finding successful ones. And then it's moving on to the next node in the graph. Uh, eventually, you get a successful layout. Um, and once you have a successful layout, really, all that remains is for an artist or a designer to go into that layout, have a look at it, and decide whether they like it or not. And if they do like it, it kind of goes into the yes pile. And if we don't like it, really, all it's a question of doing is deleting it and generating another one until we get to something that we do like. So the modular team works in this way because, obviously, it's a much easier way to create hundreds of different locations, thousands of different locations. I mean, just with the sets that we've got now, we've probably got millions of different permutations that probably could be. Um, but instead of having to hand build every interior we make, we, we spend a lot of time figuring out the rules so that we can generate hundreds over time. You are. That's okay. Oh. Awesome. Thanks, Eddie. That's pretty cool, right? Okay. So let's move on to the next team. So talk about the, the land zone team. So moving on to this location, there's a few key factors that we wanted to um, focus on. So first, it's going to be the new art style. And as I mentioned a few hours ago, Lawville Area 18, we've kind of been utilizing um, the utilitarian building set, but because this is um, Microtech, it's Microtech's kind of like home location, we knew we needed to invest our time and energy into the new building set and kind of expand on the work we've previously done with high tech. Also, we wanted to improve our approach to building our cityscapes. Um, and again, like we said this morning, like, um, None of us was really happy with um, completely walling it off. We wanted to validate sections of that city to enable the player to explore if they wanted, and learning lessons from Lowville and Area 18. OK. So for the new art style, as I said, you know, if, you look at, if you look at Lowville, you know, we wanted something that felt old, you know, um, not necessarily um, well maintained. An area 18, it was a bit more of a, a dystopian kind of like um, neon city. So we already knew right at the beginning that New Bab would we'd need something new. And also, like I said, for the narrative, it was, it was very appropriate. We'd need something um, that, that was no longer in our asset database. So this is a slide um, which we use internally. It's basically our internal architectural style document. Um, so, uh, for Star Citizen, we don't want a, a kind of a bland game. You know, we want it to feel like it's um, it's, it's kind of got a, a rich history. You know, as you're going around, you see architecture from different periods. Much like if you walk around Manchester, you know, you'll see architecture from different time periods, and it kind of gives you a, a type of layer and a, and a type of depth to the game. That's ultimately one of what we want Star Citizen to achieve. So you can see here on the timeline, this is where the high tech is. So it's, it's a lot more uh, recent to modern day, uh, current day in the game than utilitarianism. 
And it was kind of like the next stage coming out of the, the Hennoism period. So um, we kind of thought there'd be a, a very much a, an, an uprising in uh, design methodologies, you know, much more of a focus on um, industrial design styles, you know, advanced manufacturing materials, things like that. That was kind of like the, the core pillars of what we wanted this art style to achieve. Okay, so this was the first uh, kind of like concept we achieved on where it was kind of like close to the final direction of what you can see in game right now. Previously, we'd gone through quite a few iterations. Um, so, it's this, the New Babbage is kind of described as having like these beautiful domes of where the, the city's kind of inside. We tried many, 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 many ideas of um, trying to visually describe what a city inside a dome looks like, but ultimately, it, it never felt right for the game. Um, so what we did was we type of moved the dome design uh, idea and tried to make the hub of the um, landing zone and put that inside the dome. And then we keep the cityscape uh, separate. So let's talk about some key landmarks uh, that were established during this preliminary concept. We got a signature building, um, and you know we stayed fairly faithful to that guy. Um, the domes, as we mentioned, um, but we wanted to have it as additional to the city as opposed to embedded in the city. Transit lines from previous land zones, we knew that transit was going to be key. Uh, and then, as you know, it's going to be a cold planet. This is kind of what um, distilled the idea to drive the tech to help build the frozen ocean shader because we love the idea of walking out of that landing zone and rather than having to get on the transit to the spaceport and then let you out there, we wanted to get right out uh, onto the ocean straight away. But most importantly, as you can see here, all of these open areas, you know, we wanted that open feel. So if we wanted um, the hub, for the player to get out the hub and then kind of traverse on the train straight away, we're, we're trying really hard to make that uh, a possibility. Okay, so this was a video uh, we pretty much took the concept mesh, got it in game as soon as we possibly can. Um, so the aim here is to replicate um, the concept one to one, and then you start to get a sense of scale of how it's feeling. Thanks. Pass you over to Nick. Thank you. Take us on to the next section. Let that play out. So yeah, we had a really early idea of having this sprawling web uh, shape to the city with the transit uh, tunnels linking each major district together. So we're replicating that in 3D from the concept and then iterating from there. And this video shows the advancement of um, the layout and how we increased the scale from the concept was quite narrow and we broadened it out. And it's really important obviously to play it and see how it feels flying around, walking around. And this was our first time where we felt really ha happy with the sense of scale of the city. Uh, so if it's starting to feel like a real city. So, um, but we wanted to make it a little bit bigger uh, and a little bit more sprawling. So this is uh, New Babbage pretty much in its final form. Um, and in addition to the sprawling city, we've added some more uh, districts uh, further out and then having these kind of little outpost clusters on the, the mountainous horizon to make it feel like the city is not just on its own, but you know, it's, it's embedded into the, the local landscape and there's more like man-made structures beyond. So breaking down the city, um, as we've seen from the concept, here's, a, here's an in-game shot. Uh, we have the, the transit loops that go from spaceport into the city. We've got the domes, which was the central uh, place to go uh, for the players. And we've got our Aspire Grand signature building in the center, in the main uh, downtown area. When we have the sprawl, sprawl sorry, and the uh, open areas, as, as Ian's already mentioned. So we wanted to validate the design from above to make, make it uh, believable, and it, that was really important, and have the uh, feeling that the city has expanded over time, um, building out the major transit as it spreads. 
and maintaining that kind of networked composition of the city. Uh, and it's growing out around the bay as well, which gives it that really nice uh, skyline view. Thanks. So the transit tracks uh, really ground it, uh, making it a believable city. Um, it makes it feel like it's this hustling, bustling city. People have places to go. So we knew that these, um, these transit tracks that, pl that the players are actually going to take um, uh, need to be dynamic. So they weren't just straight lines everywhere. They kind of weave in between buildings and places and curve around like you see there. So let's talk about the architecture of the city itself. So we, we wanted to put a real emphasis on distinctive silhouettes of the buildings, compound curves, uh, material separation, and give it a nice elegant feel. Uh, we wanted to make it uh, distinctive from the utilitarian style like um, Area 18 and Lawville, but not push it too uh, minimal like the super modernism style. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of an in, in-between point, but it, that's where the high-tech style lives. So with the skyline, we wanted to have more kind of negative shapes and negative space created with like structures and supports and the antennas and aerials to create that uh, interesting skyline. So how did we actually make it uh, in engine? So um, to break it down, what we did was we had these very thick uh, plates, which are deliberately quite thick, so we could Im we could embed that in the snow and in the terrain, and then add integration on top of that. So we could have that at various heights. Um, the uh, tall buildings, all the skyscrapers, have been handcrafted by artists. And the gaps are filled in with lower buildings, which were made uh, in Houdini, procedurally generated out of Houdini, which the FX team did. Uh, and they did a lot of research and development into uh, with Houdini in, in getting the right variety and shape and, and, and scattering of these buildings. So these, um, these are the lower detail but higher frequency buildings, and they complement that base layering. So then uh, we need to embed those main plates with these secondary plates, which again add more layering to the city and add the believability. So here's a shot where you can see all these secondary plates added in around the main ones, which add like a really nice natural layering to the city. Uh, and they break up that kind of mega structure feel, so it doesn't feel too monolithic. Do you want to talk about the spaceport uh, design here? Sure. Thanks, Nick. OK, let's talk about the spaceport. So. Um, yeah, Chris laid down the challenge of one in a spaceport embedded in a mountain. So we started exploring visually what that could feel like. Um, and then also we wanted the idea that um, it would be almost overlooking the skyline from across the, the water feature. As this was going to be Microtech's home location, uh, you know, we wanted something where the architecture kind of reflected the brand. Uh, so as you can see here, it's, it's pretty much a combination of um, sleek and, you know, sleek architecture, but it's ingrained with technology, but it's also laid with the botanicals. And also we want to introduce the first kind of hollow greeter for this landing zone. Ultimately, you know, uh, we kind of felt the in-game implementation, you know, of the spaceport was quite good. Um, we needed to add a few more vertical towers uh, just to expand the capacity of, uh, of the spaceport, but also for design it was important because whenever you embed something into the, the, uh, the mountainside, you can't see it. And, you know, if you're coming from the other direction, design obviously had concerns about, you know, people being able to find it, you know. And also, <coughs> internally, we spend a lot of time just having a little mooch around the base of it, and it feels really good seeing ships coming and going as they fly overhead. So um, we placed the spaceport opposite the, the main city, uh, as, as you've seen in the demo. And that gives you that really good vista opportunities from both the outside of the spaceport and inside the atrium. And from the spaceport, 
you'll be able to take the train from the different sections of the city uh, using, there's a few different transit loops. And uh, also you can leave on foot or from a ground vehicle from the garages, which you can get to. So keeping the um, large window uh, in the atrium was important, showing that um, the vista and ships coming and going, and it's kind of a nice feature that um, all the other spaceports in our game have. You always want to see that traffic. <coughs> and the, the, um, the vista view is, is on the critical path from the atrium down to transit, so you kind of walk past that window going down to transit, which is a nice, nice little addition. So the main atrium uh, here, it, it serves as your hub to the different sections of the spaceport. So you, from here, you can get, go, to go to the garages, the hangars, the surface entrance, there's ship rentals, and then there's a transit system. And this shop here um, is really, shows a really good example of our high-tech building set on the interior side and ha how we've been developing the art style. Okay, so um, for the first time for this landing zone, one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to do a deep dive into what we're calling the graphical standards for the corporation. So in, in the real world, you know, huge corporations go to a graphic design agency and ask them to kind of like define their brand. Um, and, you know, we did exactly this. We were with a very talented graphic designer and what we did was we expanded down what the corporate uh, identity of Microtech would be. So essentially, it's a document outlining the principles of how the company uses graphic design to communicate. So this is an example shot of, of wall designs and how they use iconography. So when we release the location, the idea is we'd, we'd kind of layer in these details and the idea is that this would kind of just layer on that believability uh, because there's, there's a lot of traveling in our game and we wanted to help improve that navigation experience. Okay, let's talk a little bit about props. Uh, previously, we've used a lot of um, crates, barrels, trash, and as Todd likes, copper boxes. It's a but video game Microtech, after all. <laughs> yeah. for, so for Microtech, we needed like a whole new suite, right? Um, so, you know, we needed things like seating, terminals, and, um, you know, the, the turtle kind of escalated in Area 18 a little bit, so I like the idea of, um, you know, each land zone almost has a little uh, mascot, mascot yeah. so then we're like, you know, let's develop like an extreme sport penguin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's, does anyone like that penguin? Who wants that penguin in game, right? <laughs> <laughs> Done. It's done, right. man. That's it. Rain. Decision made. Okay, decision done. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, and then also here you can see, you know, we've dived into other prop designs. Um, fundamentally, the way in which we're going to dress these high-tech locations is different, you know, rather than just like, you know, going for that high-frequency feeling where it feels like it's very well lived in, we want to keep that aesthetic so a lot of the props need to work in addition to the architecture. And when you're working on a module game, it's, it's quite tricky. Okay, let's talk about the domes. Um, okay, so again, much like the cityscape, these domes um, went through many iterations. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, if you do a, do a Google search for, um, you know, sci-fi domes, you get a very, dis very specific aesthetic. It's not necessarily to my tastes. Uh, so we spent a, quite a bit of time refining that design. And we also explored the idea of like how we want to get people in and out of these domes, how we wanted to connect them together, things like that. Okay, so um, unfortunately we didn't see it on the flight path. For the longest time um, on the demo one, we had a nice track over the domes, but essentially we put them in prime real estate on the front of the, uh, the waterfront. Um, and then we've got a dedicated transit line leading directly into it. So let's, let's break down some of the key aspects. So the first area um, is called Commons, right? It's located in the smaller side of what our internal team lovingly refers to as the double bubble. <laughs> so inside the Commons, uh, there's a few things that you'd expect to see. 
So uh, the, the, the narrative past that we get, it's kind of described as like a, a kind of a douchey campus vibe. So, you know, we've got a bit of a dedicated yoga spot there. So if you want to get some yoga on, it's right there. Um, I think Steve Bender is going to get, get his mocap suit on and get, get some shots going on. Um, but also you can see some of the, the principal, principles of our aesthetic coming in here. So clean lines, beautiful and exotic plants, and technology. Okay, so the next, the next area, <laughs> my notes has completely disappeared. By the way, guys. <laughs> uh, there we go. There we go. We're uh, back. The slides are shown on the notes panel, guys. Uh, so the next area is called the plaza. So uh, essentially, this is the larger part of the, the main dome. Uh, and this was described as the corporate business park. So this is where, um, you know, it's the main hustle bustle of the location. And we wanted the, um, we wanted to kind of like convey the feeling of like, this is where the factory line is, but we wanted to convey that, um, you know, um, corporate business park vibe, but it's still located inside the dome. And then lastly, um, we got the promenade. So as you can see, it's kind of located across that sky bridge right there. And this will kind of give you that feeling of like going from the inside of one dome to another. So again, you know, building from law, um, this, this space is kind of designed, this is where the kids kind of go at night to, um, you know, take some substances. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Work hard, party hard. Yep, yep. Um, and this is where the mission giver is going to be. So this is where Eddie's going to be. Um, so uh, I think it was uh, Day. I uh, know Will came up to me a few times and were like, "Yeah, we need to kind of add some douchey elements." So those those icebergs melting into a waterfall. You can thank uh, Will for that. <laughs> okay, let's move on to habitation. So. Looking for locations to put the habitation in New Babbage, it's pretty obvious that it should be in the center, in the Aspire Grand. Uh, it's the only real choice, to be honest. And we get really nice commanding views from, from that building of the whole landing zone. So the corporation is called The Nest. Uh, it's a hab habitation um, apartment suites. And the idea of the building iconography layering into the environment itself, you got with the um, the three leaves, kind of uh, holographic leaves, uh, as part of like the the signage and the the main lobby. So there's a little shot of the uh, the balcony area, which we don't really want to spoil too much because the views out are really cool and the balcony is is you can see on both sides the uh, the views of of uh, New Babbage. So going into the hub units. These are the high-tech versions of uh, what you've seen in the utilitarian ones for the players. So they have all the same um, uh, types of modules, your, your weapon racks and your, your clothing racks and kitchens and stuff, but in that high-tech style. One review we will show is the, uh, the one from the Hab pod, which we've wanted to get in for a long time, actual real views. From your from your from your bed of the landing zone. So uh, these these aren't faked views. They're not. It's not a screen. These are the, the actual views you get. So each hab pod will have a slightly different view, and you'll wake up and uh, look outside and see see the uh, landing zone. And it'll be cool if you get one of your friends to uh, park up a ship outside, <laughs> wake, waking you up, get out of bed. <laughs> Big headlights. <laughs> so we started the process of branding uh, and the nest and getting a, a nice sleek design in with the hubs. Do you want to talk about the lighting again? Sure. So um, this is kind of like a bit of an internal exploration. Um, much in the same way with uh, the spaceships, we wanted to start looking at light sequences. Uh, so you know, ways in which we can kind of enrich this ex experience in the Habs. So what we did was try to think about, you know, when you get out of bed, in the same way, maybe at home, like lights just slowly start to lift up. Maybe the temperature of the lights start to change. 
and maybe even eventually, you know, we can kind of like expose some of this, um, expose some of this um, to players. So you know, you can define your own kind of like ambience that you want to do inside your hub. So here you can see it's it's still quite debug, but it kind of gives the idea of where we want to take things. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit about transit. Uh, so right from the beginning, we knew we wanted some um, a design that was quite brave. Um, so we, we kind of latched onto this tube design quite early. Um, for quite a period of time, it was kind of like a hyperloop, so it was sealed. Uh, but then as we expanded on developing the landing zone, um, for quite a few reasons, like we needed to, to open up that tube. Um, so for the, <laughs> for the first time, uh, you're going to be able to have open transit tracks. You'll be able to uh, land on that on. track. So, yeah. Uh, so they kind of change from being like a, um, a hyperloop to a maglev. And then, um, yeah, here you can see it kind of transitioning into production, and it's already feeling quite successful. And then also, it's the same way as what we was doing for the HABs. We was exploring ways in which we can get light sequences to aid, you know, play navigation. And I really love the idea of Rather than go left or right, I'm wondering where, which side the train's going to come. Uh, you know, maybe like the light changes, and then you kind of know. And it's also worth pointing out that this time we we didn't have transit some designed. Placeholder trains going. So on. we were like, I think you guys have seen this video, right? <laughs> yeah. I so mean, we're like, right? Okay, we don't necessarily have transit, but we have a. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, gonna trains gonna right? to, to, the trains are going to be the trains are going to be torpedo shaped, so. Yeah. OK. It's the world's most advanced uh, fast food <laughs> yeah. delivery system. Still a good video. But you can kind of get the idea of how we want to uh, advance our interiors um, through light animation. Hmm. OK. OK, so um, I'm not going to lie to you. Designing new Babbage has been extremely hard. Uh, our internal concept team is very, very good. Um, but I've been kind of stressing them out, been going through many design iterations, and the transit is, is uh, no exception. So we went through a few different designs, and here you can kind of see the, the most advanced one we got. But uh, ultimately, we wanted something that felt very aerodynamic. It felt like it could cut through the air very easily. And then because we knew we had these uh, exceptional views of the cityscape on the transit, we wanted to just open up that canopy so you can see as much of the cityscape going by. Cool. OK, let's talk about the garages. So these are another common element that we've uh, adapted for the, the high-tech style. So you'll be able to keep um, all size of ground vehicles in here from the uh, very small um, to the very large, uh, like the ballista uh, ground vehicle to some more food-based vehicles, <laughs> which we just threw in there. And the, so this is the surface entrance. So it's nestled just below the spaceport. And this is where you'll go from, you'll take an elevator down from the spaceport to your surface entrance. So this is like a, uh, essentially like a car park where every user owns uh, their own space and garage uh, to go from. So this is where you'll go from foot out into the landing zone and also take your uh, ground vehicle. So um, let's talk about how we actually integrate the uh, landing zone into the planet. And that's a good segue to, to, uh, to um, talk about Microtech in a bit. So this is an early test of uh, some biome integration um, and how we will integrate this into the, into the landscape. Um, it's also establishing the, uh, the scale read of like um, the b large, medium, and small structures. So, further, further, following further investigation, uh, this kind of shows where we're where we're at, and um, seeing everything come together with the trees and the rocks and the grass and the snow piles, give you that feeling of integration. So, I've got a couple of images of kind of before we were integrated and after. And you can see like how the 
the buildup of snow is added, um, embedding those structures and rocks. The, um, the shaders having that layer of frost, which, will, uh, which can be controlled, and that's what the, the um, BIME integration tech is currently working on. Uh, so that's, that's integrated. Here's a, here's a pretty cool nighttime shot before and after. And we still need to do a bit more work on this integration. Uh, for example, the transit tracks may not be covered in snow because you wouldn't want that to like ice up and your train plow into that. So um, there's a bit of an adjustment that needs to happen. Uh, these are the domes um, of that shot and, and uh, how integrating it just makes it feel so much better. It's like night and day and uh, it gives you, that, gets you in that holiday mood, hopefully. <laughs> And then this is the whole city uh, as well. So all of this uh, in combination uh, is working towards that initial goal and, uh, and the 3.8 release of having a very open cityscape uh, and for you guys to explore uh, on foot, on, on ground vehicle and, and, um, and, in, your, and in your ships around the uh, New Babbage landing zone. Cool, thanks Nick. Internally we're really excited about New Babbage, so um, I, think, I think we're all going to be watching um, what you guys think of it. Okay, so this is actually a really nice segue to move on to the last part of our talk. We'll talk a little bit about Microtech. So, uh, as we talked about, you know, this is uh, the first planet which we uh, approached fresh with V4. Actually, it, without V4, we would not have been able to do it. Mm. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. We, so it, we're really happy to see it, right? Yeah. yeah. So as the law describes, um, you know, it's described as a very, very cold planet. You know, there was a terraforming accident, uh, but it was perfect for Microtech to move on to. And as we knew we'd have some new tech to play with this, we, we were super into the idea of exploring like um, biomes which aren't necessarily completely covered in snow, so warmer. And um, as you might have remembered if you were in the previous talk, um, we now have this temperature humidity um, graph that we can work with. So instead of picking random uh, biomes and sort of figuring out, well, we want this there, we want this there, we have we positioned them on this uh, graph as a like a visual helper. Uh, what each of these regions would be. So we have cold, dry regions. We have uh, warmer, dry regions. We have uh, wetter regions, and uh, the bread and butter, which is like the frozen mountains and frozen forests. Mm -hmm. um, and this also informs how our temperature is formed um, on the planet. Yeah, and uh, we've been talking about this this way of approaching planets for years. Yeah. So the fact that we're kind of delivering this now, you know. It's, it's huge. Okay, let's start with breaking down some of these biomes. Uh, so let's start with biome one. So right from the beginning, we knew we wanted these epic snowy uh, kind of like mountain ranges. Uh, it was pretty much, for the longest time, this was pretty much like the core direction of what Microtech was. Um, and then there's a few elements that you can kind of see in here where these large mountain ranges kind of go down into the valleys and then that's where we'll start to see the, the pine trees being spawned. So in order to get these uh, mountain ranges looking truly, truly epic, um, we used both a selection of uh, like mountain height maps um, as well as a global elevation map. Uh, so again, in the previous uh, talk, we talked about a maximum up and down range of one kilometer. And if you want to have this, this epic uh, mountain range, uh, that, that has to go higher than one kilometer. So we needed a combination of both. And we did some exploring um, into mountain ranges on Earth, and it, like locally, the, the maximum elevation is usually, you can cover a lot of that detail uh, with a one kilometer range. It's usually uh, across like the multiple kilometers, the 10, 20, 30, that you really need this large, slow uh, increase in height. And with a combination of the global height map, as well as these uh, smaller mountain height maps that are um, distributed across, we managed to get these really epic looking mountainscapes. Yeah, the, the transition of forms between 
you know, like I said, the peaks and the lower areas, like literally everyone who's had it on the screen, you know, other members of the company come over and go, hey man, like that, that, looks, that looks really good, you know, so yeah. we're quite happy. Um, another cool feature that, that came in with, um, with V4 and Ali uh, briefly touched on it is the, is the idea of bedrock. Um, so bedrock is something that is a separate uh, layer that, that has its own colors and, and, and textures that we can apply to it. And it's dynamically ma masked on uh, slope angles. And I think this is one of those essential components that we needed to, uh, to, to make Microtech look right, as we wanted these, these steep slopes to be um, de like empty of snow, no snow, just the underlaying rock uh, being visible. So this bedrock layer uh, really uh, did the job for us. Mm. So just as an extra sneak peek, this is my monitor um, a day and a half ago. We, we have such amazing tools. This is me scrubbing the time of day. And you remember saying how important the shadows cascading over the terrain is right now? Like, like this, this was literally my editor. Um, so you can kind of see a little bit how it's feeling right now. Nice. Quite interesting. When we released Hurston, we was all about the sunset, whereas actually right, right now we're, it actually feels really good um, at other times of day as well. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Biome 2. Uh, so this kind of like is the transition from Biome 1. So as I said, we wanted these lower regions outside of the, the mountain ranges. And this was a chance for us to kind of like, you know, build up the botanical distribution. So we maybe wanted some areas that feel, you know, quite calm, quite peaceful. But then, you know, sometimes we might want areas which feel like they're kind of like half embedded under snow. And because the, the most of the palette for Microtech or most of the palette for this biome is completely monochromatic. So we're doing everything we can to, you know, create interest with silhouettes and shapes and little color accents from, you know, flowers or berries or things like that. And, uh, you know, we've seen this slide previously, but again, it gives you a good uh, indication of how, where do we start from building our, our biomass packs? So one thing we really wanted to, to do um, for a long time, um, which wasn't possible with this tiled approach, was these large scale transitions of, of vegetation and stuff like forests. Um, going transitions from like very sparse to dense and from dense to sparse over a large area. Um, with V4, we finally can do that. As you can see in the image, you see the forest like stretching out and there's no like specific end to a tile that just flows into the terrain naturally. So the object distribution being informed by terrain features, uh, we could finally achieve those transitions and I think we're quite happy with the results. Yeah, we're still pushing, you know, um that's a lot of trees, uh, <laughs> but we always want more. <laughs> um, and yeah, like, like Ian mentioned before, or uh, I think Ian or Nick, and when we're talking about the spaceport, um, it's sometimes really hard to understand and recognize scale in our game. Mm -hmm. And uh, we on the art team, I think everybody uh, has run into this situation as well. So you're building some things like, and you, you're building something that's actually way bigger than you expected, and it isn't until you start putting stuff together in the biomes and you actually start having these trees in uh, that you have a reference point, something that you understand as a human, like, okay, this is a tree, this is about the height, I can understand the scale of things now. So, uh, yeah, to when we started scattering these trees around, it, it really uh, tied everything together, and it, it really emphasized the scale of the spaceport and just how big and epic this, uh, this landscape is. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is this is from first person view. So this is uh, on foot, just taking a little hike through the snowy forest uh, on your way back because your car broke down probably. Um, <laughs> get some warm jackets on. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is this is truly something that we are super happy about. Mm -hmm. I don't think you there is any other game that has this range of, of scale uh, from, from first person close up yeah. cool stuff to these epic buildings. So interestingly, we, we actually had the spaceport embedded on the train um, much sooner than we had trees on. And we're like, 
does that spaceport look a bit small? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then literally, we got a new build with, with this in, and we are like, is that spaceport too big? <laughs> <laughs> it's when you get those, uh, those things that you, you recognize from a personal yeah, level, yeah. like I know how big a tree is, so that, that, sense, that sense of scale is, is what is much needed with these epic structures, which are, you can't really tell until you've got those kind of reference points in. No. OK, so I uh, just want to share some assets that, we, that, the, that the organics team built. Um, we have the snowy spruce trees, which is, like I said, are the bread and butter um, of, of Microtech. It's, I guess it's like almost around 80% of the, of the landscape is mountainous regions and uh, trees in the valleys. Um, so these guys are you know, the most common ones. They're in snow, uh, they have a little bit of a frosty layer, um, but they're not too heavily covered in snow. And if we go to the next one, um, we also wanted to have ones that were really like heavy snowfall, um, completely snowed under, um, and they're frozen solid. So you'll, you'll come across these guys uh, in the landscape as well. Um, also, the weather on Microtech can be really, really harsh, and blizzards and snowstorms and all the strong winds, and the lore describes... Um, yeah, uh, uh, what do you call it again? Climate accident, basically. Uh, with Terra everything. Terraforming. Terraforming uh, accident, accident yeah. yes. Um, so we want to re wanted to represent this in, in the assets as well. Um, so we made sure to show visual cues of, of the type of weather you could probably expect. Um, and it also helps to make the, um, the frozen forest a more interesting space to navigate because previously we had our rocks, we had our trees, and I think the savanna looked really cool, but you could sort of make your way around uh, quite easily. Um, so with this, it's more interesting to navigate. It's also visually more interesting to like, explore the, what's, what's on the ground. It just gives this extra layer of detail. And one further. Okay, let's move on to the next biome. So, as we said, you know, we got a bit more of a, a physically based um, approach, and we knew we were going to have like these improved transition areas. So we wanted to explore about how we could kind of introduce more color, or maybe introduce areas where it's starting to get warmer, uh, but it's actually quite close to to these snowy regions. And also, we love the idea of having, you know, um, color next to the monochromatic mountain ranges. And you know, it gives us an opportunity to inject color into the frame uh, with things like flowers and things like that. So here we see one of those transitions. And um, I made a little joke about this in the previous uh, the presentation, that this is what the transitions now look like. So no more tiles. And, um, so with the updated tech, we're seeing these beautiful transitions. And they're informed by, and at the same time, emphasizing the shapes of the terrain. Um, so we're really happy with those results. And here are some examples up close. I like the, the spring vibe that is going on. The frost is gone, little flowers start popping up again. And although these areas are quite calm and nice to have a little hike through, the, the snowy mountains are never far away. So we always want to remind the player that um, yeah, it's, it's still a cold planet. And once again, these transitions, um, we're super, super happy with how these flow into each other. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the assets that we did for the biome. Um, fairly small, but simple pack, some nice colors, some nice flowers, and some remaining roots and, and trees that uh, did not survive uh, the initial uh, frost. So just wanted to show some remnants of that. OK, next biome. So. Um, Okay, um, so as a kind of like an offset to these snow regions, um, I was really uh, quite passionate about having areas of like quite intense color. Uh, so then we explored like these type of regions, you know, um, again like reds, oranges, and things like that. Um, and then also as part of the the asset pack reuse, you know, maybe instead of these rocks being covered with snow, you know, we start to build up the lichen on there as well. So these areas show actually what Microtech would look like if without all the snow and ice. And um, so we're seeing the same spruce actually as a, a conscious choice to have those return in a more uh, unfrozen state, uh, just to tie these areas uh, together. 
And obviously, as you can see in the distance, um, to remind the player that these warmer regions are, uh, there are not that many of them. So we wanted to make sure that there's always this epic mountains uh, in, in the background, reminding the player that, yeah, they're not, never far away. Yep. Uh, some of the assets that we did for the Taiga region. So you see the red lichen, um, and the rocks and the ground cover. Everything has a bit more warmer colors. Uh, some more of the spruce in the same uh, color variations. And um, in order to emphasize these, these warmer colors, we uh, added a few more tree types um, because the spruces are really cool, but they're evergreen. So they basically gave us the green, but didn't give us the, the warmer reds and, and oranges on like eye height. So we wanted to have these guys in there as well. Um, we already did a bunch of these broken assets, and we figured we might as well have them on the warmer areas as well. I mean, it's trees break down, they, they fall on the ground, they, they rot away. So it's the circle of life. And if we want to do a dense forest, I think that's a, a necessary component. Plus the previous reasons of the complexity on the ground being uh, nice and detailed, I think that was a good reason to keep them. And some more examples of these guys. OK. Next biome. Um, we've talked about snow biomes. We've talked about uh, quite botanical heavy. And we've talked about uh, like an offset. For someone like this, I thought it'd be really quite interesting if we described areas that were very bleak, you know, very dark, very cold. Uh, and then maybe the idea is that these are located like maybe on the poles. Um, so you know, the sun angle is always quite low. And then, you know, it was quite heavily inspired about, you know, you see these areas, uh, even on Earth, where, like, the glacial melt is kind of happening. Big chunks of ice are being left behind. And then also for, like, um, maybe a little twist on the asset pack, you know, we start to introduce, like, maybe these large slabs of obsidian in combination with some of the gravel that you'd expect to see. And here it is in game. And what's really cool about it is because it, it is at the poles. The sun is always at a very low angle. Um, and you could say it's on purpose, but actually it was a bit of a happy accident where this, these, these low sun angles played really nicely with, uh, with the glossy obsidian that we, that we were scattering. Yeah. Mm. So we've done boulder fields before, but I think this one uh, really stands out. Um, so these are some of the asset packs that we created for, for this biome. And um, the next thing that the organics team wants to look at after we're getting close to wrapping up uh, Planet V4 is uh, increasing the asset quality. And we're doing that with a new shader that's being developed uh, with the graphics team. It's not completely done yet, but here's a bit of a preview of what you can expect um, of the, the, the quality of rocks and assets that will be uh, visible. OK, lastly. Last buy on number six. So this was always our wish list. Um, and again, this is what helped drive a little bit more of that shader development. You know, as we knew it was going to come down into the, the coastline, we wanted to get people like on, on the ice, walking on the ice. So uh, like I said, it was kind of driving a lot of that tech development. Um, yeah, so to create the frozen ocean, we wanted to reuse some of the features from our existing ocean uh, and expand on um, making the sur uh, on that, basically. So we wanted the, the surface to be solid. Uh, we needed to add some additional features um, to help sell this broken look, both when flying over it, so at this uh, further distance, as well as when you're right on, on, uh, on top of it. Um, and it doesn't really actually show uh, but when you're walking on it and you look down, you actually see the um, multiple layers yeah, like of cracks in the ice, uh, refraction going on. So it's, it's quite a cool experience to, to, uh, to walk over this. And uh, who knows, maybe there's some stuff hidden underneath the ice. Um, so to complement these transitions into these frozen oceans, we wanted to have some stuff that reminded us um, when you go to the poles and you see these, these large chunks of ice that broke off and sort of are floating around. Um, in, the, in our case, they're all along the side, along the coast, um, and frozen shut by yeah, the, the, the storms that basically <laughs> keep happening. Someone mentioned the other day that that iceberg looks a little bit like the Aspire Grand Tower. <laughs> so maybe that's like the, the it's your challenge. There was, to a, fly a, was that. One of, there was the extreme sports penguin being artistic. Right. <laughs> okay. He was inspired. So as always, you know, it's always a massive team effort. So this is the art team and lighting team that you can see. So uh, great job to everyone.